and we can see in near real time um, whether or not an athlete has sustained a particularly big hit or a lot of hits. And we can kind of get ahead of the problem by saying, hey, player X has sustained a really big hit. Let's pull them aside, just see how they're doing. This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. I'm Nate Podger. In the United States, 15% of high school athletes are affected by concussions every year, according to the CDC. And repeated head impacts can have devastating long-term neurological consequences. Nicholas Checky is a PhD student in bioengineering at Stanford University who is working to make contact sports a little safer for athletes at all levels of play. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nate, for having me. Appreciate it. So I want to start with going back a little bit. Um, what drew you into investigating brain injury? Yeah. So I've always been really passionate about sports. It was a big part of my upbringing. Um, and even into young adulthood, I've continued playing sports. Uh, when I was studying my mechanical engineering degree at UC Irvine, um, I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do with my career at the time, but I was still playing sports. I was really involved in water polo. Uh, my second year of college, I sustained a pretty serious concussion uh, at a practice during water polo. And um, it just so happened, kind of coincidental timing. There was a professor at UC Irvine, Dr. Jim Hicks, who was leading the world's first study on head impacts and concussion in water polo specifically. Uh, so me perfect being, timing, <laughs> perfect timing. <laughs> so me being this sports aficionado and playing water polo and having the recent brain injury, I reached out to him and quickly got involved in the research and had that kind of personal experience with the sport and the injury to kind of drive my motivation um, to continue that research. That was about a decade ago, and I haven't looked back since then. I've been working in protective headgear development and concussion research since. So. Thinking about repetitive head injuries, what kind of long-term effects are there? Yeah, so it really um, depends on how severe your TBI is, uh, traumatic brain injury, TBI. So um, the range of traumatic brain injuries is pretty wide. So some can be as severe as causing death or lifelong disabilities, and there are also extreme injuries that can be recovered from, like skull fractures or brain bleeds. Our lab at Stanford, we mostly look at concussion right now. Um, concussion symptoms are usually things like headaches, nausea, blurred vision, sensitivity to light, um, maybe slurred speech, um, changes in mood and behavior. There's a lot of different symptoms that can come right. with it. These symptoms can last on the scale of a few days for very mild concussions, but even last up to several months and manifest as post-concussive syndrome. Now, concussions aren't the only problem, though. There's actually subconcussive impacts, which won't present with any immediate symptoms, but the cumulative burden of these repeated subconcussive head impacts, like football players sustain right. over the lifetime of a career, have been linked to later life depression and neurodegenerative diseases. So you can have immediate symptoms, but these are also symptoms that can kind of creep up on you later in life. So it's important that for all types of these brain injuries, we're making an effort to stay ahead of it. Right. I think that awareness of the small or the, what we think of as smaller impacts is important. Yeah. I think we've had a couple pretty well-known football players in the last decade or two that after they pass, they found all kinds of strange yep. things going on with the brain. Exactly. So what are the challenges to detecting traumatic brain injuries? Yeah. So if you have a really severe traumatic brain injury, like those skull fractures or brain bleeds, uh, you can usually go into a doctor's office and those will be able to be detected with medical tool or medical imaging tools like CT scans or MRI. If you have a mild concussion, um, it's not so clear cut of a process. So usually concussions are diagnosed through symptom reporting. So you'll sustain an impact. Uh, you'll show up at the doctor and say, hey, I've been having headaches. I'm trouble sleeping, sensitivity to light, whatever your symptoms are. And then they'll say, based on those symptoms, you probably have a concussion. Um, there's no real clear cut um, objective way to say this is guaranteed to be a concussion right now. Um, with the subconcussive impacts, it's even harder because mm -hmm. those don't present with any 
with any symptoms. So we kind of don't know at this time how many is too many impacts, how hard of an impact was too hard of an impact. So our lab has actually developed instrumented mouth guard technology um, where we have these mouth guard devices like um, a mouth guard that athletes would normally wear during their normal sport participation. But on the inside, we have these soft, flexible circuit boards that have an accelerometer and gyroscope on the inside. Mm. So the athletes will be wearing these instrumented mouth guards during their normal sport participation. And we can see in near real time um, whether or not an athlete has sustained a particularly big hit or a lot of hits. And we can kind of get ahead of the problem by saying, hey, player X has sustained a really big hit. Let's pull them aside, just see how they're doing, maybe give them a rest, maybe before any of those big symptoms occur. The problem with this technology, though, is that there's no clearly defined uh, biomechanical threshold for concussion or serious side effects of head impacts yet. So this isn't this can't be used as a diagnostic tool yet. Right. You're really just establishing what the numbers you're even looking at are, like mm-hmm. building the data set that anything that could be used for yeah. that in the future would build off of. Yeah. What was testing that product out in the field like? Yeah. So um we obviously had to get players to buy into wearing this. Um, It did take some time to get it to a place where it was comfortable and felt the same as the normal mouth guards. Um, But we were actually able to gather a lot of really interesting data with these mouth guard devices. The most interesting thing that we were able to gather was uh, information on how helmets were performing on the field. Because there's a lot that goes on in the lab um, that we do to test helmets, but we never really follow up too much on how they're performing on the field. And really, really interestingly, uh, in one of our studies from a couple years ago, with the mouth guard data, we saw that helmets that performed significantly different from one another in the lab didn't actually perform differently on the field. They performed about Mm -hmm. the same. And so really what I think we're seeing there is the need to develop a totally revolutionary technology that isn't just an incremental step change, but it goes a long, long ways to make a big impact in safety that will actually be able to observe, not just in the controlled, perfect lab environment, but on the field as well. So as you're moving into this current paper and this current research, why liquid shock absorbers in the Yeah. So great question. Uh, There's a lot of different technologies that are used in helmets for a variety of applications. Um, But the one thing that remains true for helmets is there's limited space in a helmet. We can't just make a huge pillow helmet as big as we want. Uh, We need to choose a shock absorber that will give protection for all kinds of impacts, because especially in football, we have those slow, small repeated head impacts, and then we get some big ones that are going to cause concussions or more serious events. Um, So traditionally, foams have been used in helmets, and the foams that are used um, exert a force based on how much they're compressed. Now, this isn't ideal because it leads to foams being tuned for a very specific range of impacts. Mm -hmm. So if the foam is tuned for a really slow impact, the foam is going to compress down and reach its maximum compression too early and it'll bottom out. That means the foam won't be able to do any more work and it'll lead to a high spike in the impact force when a fast impact comes. Now, if a foam is tuned for a really severe impact, like a concussive impact, it'll make the foam too stiff to help for the repeated subconcussive impacts that are slower, that'll build up over a lifetime. So the reason we chose liquid is because uh, we needed a technology that's adaptive to different velocities. The liquid shock absorbers that we've made, uh, like this one here, this is a prototype that we've got, uh, was inspired by the hydraulic shock absorbers that are used in, for example, your vehicle's suspension system. So hydraulic shock absorbers can adapt to provide a soft response at different velocities. Um, However, Uh, In a helmet, we obviously can't have big, rigid metal components like you have in your vehicle's suspension system. So our design uses kind of the same principles of hydraulic shock absorption, but is made out of all soft components. So we've got on the outside a high-strength fabric that surrounds a liquid that's contained in a central chamber. When the shock is compressed, fluid ejects out laterally, 
to a part in the helmet that presumably would not be under impact. And then after the impact is over, that fluid comes back into the central chamber. Uh, now, one more thing is there actually are some foams that can adapt their response to different velocities, like viscoelastic foams. Uh, however, their performance is really sensitive to changes in temperature. So if you get too hot, those foams get mm -hmm. really, really soft. If you get too cold, the foams really stiffen up and they don't work like they're supposed to. Now, what we've, what we've observed in our some of our experimental studies is that as long as we're not picking a fluid that freezes like water or evaporates with temperature changes, um, we've observed pretty consistent results when we change the temperature of the impact environment. So we're still getting that adaptive response in a wide range of settings. That set me up to ask you, what kind of liquid is in there? <laughs> yeah, so right now um, we're using... Uh, it's called propylene glycol. So it's used in a lot of cosmetics and even the food industry. But we've also looked at things like mineral oil or just other uh, liquids that won't have, that'll have a particularly low freezing point um, because helmets are used in all sorts of applications like snow helmets right. or military helmets, et cetera. So I think this is, this question's more philosophical, I guess. Mm -hmm. How important is modeling as you're developing a product? Yeah. Um, so I'll be honest, I don't think modeling is a necessity to building a new product, but it certainly can help save a lot of time and money, especially when we're developing a new technology like ours that is just like nothing at all that's on the market today. Usually in helmets, you've got plastic structures or foams, and we're trying to put liquid in a helmet. So the real benefit to modeling is that we can run a series of simulations that change the material properties or the shape or size of our device. And we can run that series of simulations overnight or maybe, you know, over the course of a few days. Whereas if we wanted to get a manufacturer to make a bunch of prototypes for us that had all those changes, it would maybe take weeks or months and thousands of dollars. The other benefit of the simulation and modeling environment is that it's really, really controlled. And while that might not be exactly what happens in the real world, if we're trying to get to the bottom of why we're seeing the results that we're seeing, we can go back and replay the simulation over and over again and kind of see and pinpoint why did we get the result that we got. Rather than if we have a prototype that's not perfect and then it breaks, we have to remake it. We have to rerun the experiment all over again. Right. Can you talk a little bit about how you guys test things in the laboratory there? Yeah. So we pretty much have two main test setups. One is for testing helmet materials at the kind of component level. We want to see how does the shell, how does the shock absorber, how does the comfort padding all respond to a uniaxial impact. And then we've also got full helmet tests where we've got helmets that are fit onto a crash test dummy and a big impact ram that goes and slams into them at velocities representative of concussions on the field. For the helmet shock absorber tests, those component level tests, we're really just looking at how does the material itself behave when different sorts of loading is, are, um, are input to that uh, shock absorber system. For the helmet tests, we're looking at what happens to the head and brain and neck um, when a full helmet system is placed on that dummy. In your opinion, could we zero out concussive risk with the right kind of helmet? Yeah, so it's a lofty goal for sure. Um, <laughs> but I do think that it's possible. Um, if we look back several decades at skull fractures and more serious life-threatening head injuries, they used to be quite common in sport of uh, football. Um, but once the right injury metrics were used to evaluate those risks and standardized testing organizations like Noxy uh, implemented regulations for helmet technologies to advance and meet certain safety criteria, it nearly eliminated that type of injury, those skull fractures. Uh, we don't really see those hardly at all in football anymore. So I think this is something that we could see with concussions one day. But I will say, I think with concussion specifically, it's not going to be as simple as developing a new technology or setting a new or injury risk criteria that immediately just solves all the problems. 
Technology is definitely a major part of the solution, but you're going to need a kind of multi-pronged approach to solving concussion. And right now, I think that would first start with better helmet technology, but also you're going to need rule changes that promote safer gameplay. You're going to need constant monitoring with things like <laughs> instrumented mouth guards to remove players who are taking too much to or too much burden. Um, and also just improved education for athletes, coaches, training staff to really let everybody know how how serious concussion is. Right. And it's it's like you mentioned earlier that a lot of it is self-reported and you're talking about the symptoms that you're experiencing. So the whole of what a concussion is or isn't is subjective to a certain yeah. extent. And not everybody wants to pull them out when they're feeling those symptoms, or maybe not everybody understands, ah, I kind of got a little headache. Is that because I just slept bad or is that because I just took 10 hits to the head? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Pivoting a little bit, you mm -hmm. had talked about uh, a lot of experience with water polo, and I, I know you you patented a helmet at some point uh, yeah. earlier in your career. So I would yeah. like to hear about that helmet in here too. But I'm curious about what you can tell me about brain impacts in different kinds of sports like football versus water polo or lacrosse or even soccer that we don't necessarily wear helmets for, but there's definitely an impact to the head situation going on there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I will definitely start off by saying every sport is different. Risk for concussion and head impact exposure is different for every sport. It's even different amongst different player positions within the same sport. So you can't just say, you know, one approach or one technology or one helmet is going to solve concussion risk for every single sport. Um, I guess I'll start by talking about water polo, <laughs> my favorite sport. Uh, so in water polo, just kind of going back to the study that I was a part of at UC Irvine, um, what we were focused on was kind of having that sport specific approach to solving or kind of understanding the head impact and concussion problem. So what we found by placing head impact sensors on athletes as they went through all their games and practices, um, we found that the frequency of the head impacts, the number of head impacts and the type of impacts that players were sustaining was largely dependent on the position that a player played. So, for example, the centers in water polo who are sitting right in front of the goal, usually accruing the most goals and getting in the most physical altercations with other players, they sustain the most impacts. And those types of impacts were impacts to the back of the head. So the player, the centers would be going for the ball and their defender would come up behind them, whether intentionally or not, striking them in the back of the head. When we published those results, uh, there was a rule change that came out shortly after that more strictly penalized uh, impacts from behind. So contact from behind a player is now more strictly penalized. So kind of cool. We saw that um, immediately lead to a rule change that's kind of trying to solve that head impact problem. Now, when it comes to concussions, we found that the centers were getting the most impacts, but they weren't getting the most concussions. Mm -hmm. It was the goalies who got the most concussions. And it wasn't physical altercations with other players causing the concussions. It was impacts from the ball. So very, very different types of impacts, very, very different types of uh, consequences from those impacts that we were seeing. So what we did was we evaluated some existing protective headgears, and we also developed our own protective headgear, and then we tested them in the lab with a, a crash test dummy to see how effective those headgears were for those ball-to-head impacts. We found that they were pretty effective rather than wearing just the normal polyester cap that players wear today. So like the rule change with the centers, we also found that after publishing those results, there was a new rule change that paved the way for allowing padded protective headgears in the sport. So pretty cool there. In soccer, um, no headgear is required. Um, we do see some players wearing protective headbands or soft-shelled headgears, um, but really the main source of head impacts in soccer is headers. Um, these usually aren't going to lead to concussions, but it's that buildup over time of those repeated subconcussive impacts that has been linked to uh, later life risk of neurodegenerative diseases. And we've seen some studies like that in soccer, so, or soccer specifically. What we try to do in soccer, because wearing a headgear in soccer can really change the dynamics of the game um, when you're doing all those headers, uh, we tried to see if we could alter the inflation pressure of the ball 
to see if that would have any sort of impact. Um, and what we found was that if you dipped ball inflation pressure below the range regulated by FIFA or the NCAA, we could get a pretty significant reduction in the severity of those impacts. Now, that would be hard to translate to gameplay, of course, because kicking a soft kind of deflated ball around is going to be different than one that's totally pumped up. But this could be something useful for just getting kids into the right training technique for headers. Or if you just want to take a couple reps, deflate that ball a little bit, and it actually could have a meaningful impact. I want to mm -hmm. ask you about your experience with the NSF funding and your graduate research fellowship uh, award. What was that experience like for you? Yeah. So um, the application process is rigorous. You know, it's it's a very, it's a great fellowship. So it was a lot of hard work. Um, but getting the fellowship has mostly to me, what it's meant to me has been kind of the freedom to pursue my passion for this field of research in a way that um, I really want to. So I'm not locked into a specific grant or a specific project that I'm not thrilled about, but I'm able to kind of take my research in various different directions, invent new technologies, work with different uh, populations. Um, yeah. And then the NSF also has a bunch of great professional development opportunities um, that give you more than just, you know, the typical graduate uh, school experience. Um, can, what bit of research did you specifically work on under that? Yeah. So for the uh, GRFP, um, I've been working on the development of the liquid shock absorbers. Okay. Yeah. I want to, I want to kind of close out thinking about your development and, and in the, in the paper, you're mostly modeling, right? It wasn't a physical specimen yep. so much. So what is next steps there? Are you, have you built a prototype that's physical. What are you seeing with that if you have already? Yeah. Yeah. So we do have a, some exciting results that we're working on publishing right now where we've kind of built out the uh, physical liquid shock absorbers and then implemented them into a helmet. I um, mean, we're seeing really good results so far. Um, obviously, though, when you design a product, there's more that goes into it than just the safety performance. So we've got to work on things still with industry collaborators like the comfort and the aesthetics and all that. So really, there's um, a big translation ahead of making this look like a really nice product that um, people are going to know is more than just a science project. Cool. Yeah. Um, how are, are, are you happy seeing the kind of con concept becoming the physical thing? It's the most satisfying thing ever. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when your model um, matches up with your experimental results. It's it's really satisfying and it just gives you a lot of faith in the whole scientific process that we're going through to kind of make a big impact in head protection. Special thanks to Nicholas Checky. For the Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts. And if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.